your warrior prepares for battle. Today, I claim victory over Satan by putting on the whole armor of God, which you have given me. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. By faith, your warrior has put on the whole armor of God. I am prepared to live this day in spiritual victory. When King David asked God to reveal any sins in his life, he prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart, not my mind or my soul, but my heart. The Bible associates holiness and righteousness with the heart. And when it came to identifying a piece of armor to guard against unrighteousness, then Paul chose the piece of armor that covers the heart of the soldier, the breastplate of righteousness. That is the title, in fact, of today's message, the fourth in our series, Spiritual Warfare, Terms of Engagement. Today we'll learn why it is Christ's righteousness that is the ultimate defense for our own heart, and how being in Christ becomes a defense against the temptations to sin that confront us every day. I hope you'll join me for that lesson on today's edition of Turning Point. We prepare for battle according to the book of Ephesians by putting on the whole armor of God. The question we have to ask today is this, am I living the kind of life that enables me to engage in this war? Have I put on the breastplate of righteousness? I need to tell you a little story. When I first started in the ministry years ago, I didn't know very much about evangelism and I was wanting to learn because I had started a church with just seven families and I knew that if we didn't win people to Jesus, that church would only and always be seven families. I did not have as my goal in life to just be the pastor of seven families forever, so I wanted that church to grow. But here I was, a graduate of college, Bible college, graduate of seminary. I had really never personally led anyone to Christ. I didn't know how to do it. And just about that time, James Kennedy had put forward his evangelism explosion method of evangelism. And I learned that through a very wonderful way, having listened to it on a tape and then transcribing the tape and writing it all down. And, practicing on Donna. I always laugh because I got her lost and saved so many times. It's a wonder she's not so confused. But um, I'll never forget when I got Jim Kennedy's notes in, in the final notes before it became a book, he asked the question, why don't Christians tell others about their faith? Why don't they witness? And Dr. Kennedy anticipated that the answers would come back something like this and in this order. Number one, I don't witness because I am afraid. Number two, I don't feel like I'm equipped and have never been taught how. And number three, I don't know any people who are unsaved so that I can get involved and get to know them. He thought those would be the top three answers. He said to his surprise that none of those things were in the top five. In fact, he said the first reason and the overwhelming first reason in all of the surveys was this, I don't witness because of the life that I live. The people who answered the anonymous questionnaire were at the center of why it is important to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is a piece of armor that covered the body from the neck to the thighs. It consisted of two parts covering the front and partially around toward the back. The warrior without his breastplate was dangerously exposed to the enemy and could easily be killed because his vital organs were left unprotected. He could take an arrow to the heart and his life would be snuffed out immediately. When we are told to put on the breastplate of righteousness, it is a spiritual, symbolic thing that we are called to do. I want to suggest to you that symbolically, putting on the breastplate of righteousness involves four things. Number one, the breastplate symbolizes the righteousness of Christ. The Bible tells us that when we become Christians, immediately we are given the righteousness of Christ. Paul wrote about this in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 1.30. He said, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and 
righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What that means simply is this, listen carefully, that when Jesus Christ came down to this earth as the perfect son of God, he went to the cross and he died. When he hung upon the cross, two major things happened. It is the greatest transaction that has ever occurred in all of the world's history. At the moment in time when Jesus died, he took our sin upon himself. He became sin for us. That's what the scripture says. All of our sin, all of us, living now, living before us, and those who live after us if the Lord tarries, all of our sin was placed on the heart and life of the Lord Jesus as he hung on the cross, and he paid for all of that sin through his death. But secondly, the Bible says that when we put our trust in him for eternal life, not only does he forgive our sin, but he gives to us his righteousness. And we become positionally righteous in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest bargain the world has ever known. I have never been able to understand why people turn that down. This is the greatest opportunity anybody has ever had to get rid of your sin and in its place get the righteousness of Christ. I mean, how could you not want to do that? Now, it is not uncommon for Jesus' saving work to be reduced by well-meaning teachers merely to his death on the cross. I mean, true, the suffering of Jesus for our sin is the center of the gospel message. There could have been no salvation for us unless Jesus had died, bearing the penalty due for our transgressions. But it is only one half of what is necessary. It is the negative side of what he did for us. The positive side is the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to us so that we are now able to stand before God clothed in that righteousness. In other words, his perfect Active obedience was necessary for salvation. He gave us his righteousness. That is what happened. And that is why Paul was able to write these words, that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It's not so much about anything else other than this. Your sin has been forgiven, and you have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So I don't have to be worried when Satan accuses me before the Father. I mean, when the Father looks at me, he sees Christ and his righteousness. So that is called positional righteousness. That means the righteousness I always have with God, no matter what's going on in my life, Almighty God sees me through what Jesus did on the cross. He knows that my sins were forgiven by his death, and he knows that the righteousness which Christ earned through his perfect obedience was transferred to my life. I now have the cover of Jesus on the book of my life. I don't know what that does for you, but boy, I'll tell you what, that's an amazing truth, is it not? So the breastplate of righteousness means that I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That is kind of the first level of protection. The breastplate symbolizes Christ's righteousness. But the breastplate also symbolizes the Christian's righteousness. Here's the best definition that I've ever heard of sanctification. Here's what it is. Sanctification, now listen to me carefully, is becoming in practice what you already are in position. You see that? What are you in position, class? You're the righteousness of Christ. Now the Bible says that as we walk on this earth, Almighty God wants us to live in light of what we already are. He wants us to walk in righteousness. He wants us to live righteous lives. If the problem with many Christians is that they wear the positional armor, but they don't want to wear the practical armor. This armor symbolizes not only Christ's righteousness, but it symbolizes the righteousness of the Christian. It is us living the righteous life, along with the fact that Christ has imputed his righteousness to us. We have that before God. Now it's our responsibility every day to live in light of who we are. Somebody said, if we are righteous in Christ up there, he should be righteous in us down here. <laughs> Isn't that true? He wants us to live like we know what it means to be in Christ. And the scriptures instruct us continually to practice and pursue righteousness. You see, if all we need is 
positional righteousness so that we can be prepared for warfare, there would not be any instruction in the Word of God for us to live righteous or to pursue righteousness. But let me just give you two or three scriptures that will help you understand how vitally important this is. In this, the children of God, 1 John 3.10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Revelation 22, 11, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. 1 Timothy 6, 11, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Thomas Merton one time wrote that the enemy is more easily overcome if he is not suffered to enter the door of our hearts, but is resisted without the gates at his first knock. In other words, that we should always be on guard that not only we understand the righteousness of Christ which has been given to us in our salvation, but that we have been called by this same God who effected the transaction to live lives of righteousness and to be righteous people. The Bible teaches us that we're to put on righteousness. Turn back in your Bibles if you're still open to Ephesians 6 to the fourth chapter. And the Bible tells us that we are to put on righteousness. Verse 24 of the fourth chapter says, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. In the book of Revelation, we are told that when we get to heaven, listen to me, I don't know if you ever knew this before, when we get to heaven, we're going to be clothed in our righteousness, in linen clothing representing our righteousness. And someone has suggested if some Christians don't get things straightened out, in heaven, they're going to be indecently exposed. <laughs> you see, here's the careful balance. It's first of all about what Christ has done for us in making us righteous. And then it's secondly about what he asks us to do in light of what he has done for us, simply that we live as righteous people. And that is a part of the breastplate of righteousness, which the Bible tells us to put on. You may wonder what this has to do with conflict. Let me explain. Apart from a righteous life, the Christian really has no defense against Satan's accusations. Satan will make you doubt whether you're even a Christian. You won't witness because you will think, how can I tell them what Christ has done for me when my life is not any different than theirs? So here we are. We're talking about how we're going to make it through this time. And, you know, these are pretty serious things that Paul is teaching us, that we need to be people of truthfulness that we need to believe in the objective truth of God. And now he's talking about our lives. We need to understand what Christ has done for us at the cross, forgiving our sin and giving us his righteousness. But then we need to understand that along with the positional righteousness, which makes us perfectly acceptable before God, he wants us to live in light of who we are. He wants us to become in practice what we already are in position. The breastplate symbolizes Christ's righteousness, and it symbolizes the Christian's righteousness. Thirdly, the breastplate symbolizes consistent righteousness. Notice that in the text in Ephesians, it says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. It's a very interesting change in the words. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, which means it is not just a one-time thing. It is not something we do and then it is done. We continually put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is not a one-day-a-week luxury. It is seven-days-a-week necessity. It is not something we piously parade the first day of the week. It is something we must live every day of the week if it is going to work in the warfare. The breastplate symbolizes Christ's righteousness. It symbolizes the Christian's righteousness. It symbolizes consistent righteousness. And then last but not least, this breastplate of righteousness symbolizes controlled righteousness. The Bible teaches us that we're to make a habit out of living righteously. We're to cultivate these principles in our lives until, like a habit, they become an automatic part of who we are. We don't have to sit down and think about what to do in every situation like we may have had to do when we began. You know when you become a Christian, little by little, you're digging the furrows into the hard drive of your mind, and little by little, those things become a part of who you are. They just become a part of who you are. That's what it means to be consistently and controlled in the righteousness of Christ in your life. The significance of the armor is not only what the armor is, but where it is worn. 
The breastplate of righteousness fits right over the vital organs. Basically, it was given to the soldier to protect his heart. It was for the purpose of guarding his heart against the enemy's arrows that could snuff out his life in a moment. This is the same reason why many of our police and others wear bulletproof vests, because the vest protects them against a bullet. They wear that bulletproof vest in a very specific place to cover the heart. And just as the girdle of truth is worn on the loins to strengthen us for service, the breastplate is worn upon the breast to protect our heart. The heart is the seat of emotion. It is the seat of affection. The heart is a picture of our emotions. It is that inner visceral us where we really live, but it is actually your physical heart as well. Let me explain, when you are angry, and I know nobody here ever gets angry, but let's just for a moment assume that that happens. When you are angry, your heart pumps so much blood that your face gets red. Isn't that true? See, nobody gets angry here, so they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Here's one that you might have. When you experience fear, your heart forgets to pump blood and you turn white. Isn't that true? So your heart is, your physical heart, you know, it's truly, it's connected with your emotions in some respect. Don't tell me your heart is not involved in your emotions. Sure it is. Sir, when you got married, you didn't call your girlfriend your sweet head. You called her your sweetheart, right? <laughs> because she was special to you and you had a great desire for her. How do you put on the breastplate of righteousness? Here's just an interesting little thought about where the righteousness is in the armor. It starts with our heart, doesn't it? We need to fall in love with Jesus again. Instead of trying to live better, we need to learn how to love better. We need to fall in love with God again because that relationship will dictate our conduct. When you learn how to love the Lord through his word and through prayer and through fellowship and through worship and through interaction and accountability, when you practice the art of holiness, when you take time to be holy and you love God from your heart, it will start to change your life. Please, Lord Jesus, help me never to do anything that will disappoint you or will, will bring grief and sadness to you. I'm sure I have done it, but my heart is that I understand more than ever before the love that God has had for me through the, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, and the terrible anguish that Jesus went through that I might be redeemed, and I am in love with him. I am unashamedly in love with Jesus Christ. And because I am in love with him, it dictates the things that I do and the things that I don't do. Some things that I might do, I am caught up short because I love him. And I love him only because I have discovered in a new and fresh way how much he loves me. And that's what I think the breastplate of righteousness is all about. It's there to protect our heart so that our heart is not wounded in ways that make it impossible for us to live lives of holiness based upon our love for God in heaven and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you put on the breastplate of righteousness, you are dealing with your heart. Where is your heart? So many modern Christians are losing the battle here. We've gotten caught up in what the world has to offer, and our heart is off in some other place. And where our heart is, the Bible tells us, our treasure ends up being there too. Where your heart is dictates your lifestyle. Where your heart is sets your priorities. Sometimes uh, kids will come to me, especially when I was uh, president of the college, and we would get into discussions about certain kinds of entertainment. And uh, they would ask me, do you think I can do this? Can I get by with this? What they were saying is, how close can I get to the things of the world without getting in trouble with God? And when we do that, are we not giving away our affection? If you really love somebody, you don't try to live as far away from them as you can. You do everything to live as close to them as you can. This is the nature of love, and when you love God, you will want to live as God wants you to live. You won't be seeking how to walk as far away from him as you can. You'll be trying to learn how to walk as close to him as you can. Perhaps you would think, well, if I live this way, if I take on this challenge to be in practice what I am in position, if I ask God to help me love him more so that I can live, I can't imagine, Pastor, all the stuff I'll have to give up. 
And unfortunately, legalistic churches have fostered that idea that when you become a Christian, you give up all these things. I don't drink, I don't dance, I don't chew, and don't talk to people that do. I mean, that's kind of how it went, you know? <laughs> that's the way it looks. But I want to tell you something. Whenever you are pursuing the righteousness of Christ, and he gets you so in love with Jesus that you begin to realize that you're uncomfortable with some of the things that's going on in your life and you walk away from them, you never miss them because God replaces them with something far better. You cannot ever give up anything to God that he doesn't make it better. He takes what you give him, transforms it, and gives it back to you in a better way than you could ever have known it before. Do you remember the boy who gave up his lunch? He had the joy of watching 15,000 people get served dinner, and then he received back 12 times more than he had when he started out that morning. You say 15,000? Yeah, it only counted the men. So if you want the real number, it's the men plus a wife and probably a child here and there. 15,000 people served because one boy gave up something to Jesus. And then there was the man who had a tomb, and God asked him to give that up. And he got it back three days later, all sweetened with perfume. And with the testimony that Jesus had stayed there for three days and then was resurrected. And then there was the man who was asked to give up their donkey. Do you remember that? I, I don't know if he really wanted to do it or not. You can't really tell from the text. But I have to believe that as long as that donkey was on this earth, he was the most famous donkey in all of Palestine. You don't ever give up anything to God that God does not give back to you, and you cannot outgive God. And when you give him your life, and you ask him to make you the kind of person he wants you to be, and you give yourself to him in that kind of commitment and submission, you're putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Now you're getting ready to go to war. You've got truth that you believe in and truthfulness in your heart. You've got the righteousness of Christ which clothes you and makes you accepted to God, and you have your own practical righteousness every day walking in truth, walking in truth. The human body can withstand damage to many of its parts and organs and still live, except that is for the heart. And the same is true spiritually. When our spiritual heart is damaged by sin, true spiritual life is impossible. All of our hearts have been damaged by sin, but they can be repaired made new by the righteousness of Jesus Christ's heart, a righteousness he gives to us when we place our faith in him.